Well, welcome everybody. My name's Ari Bruning. I'm the uh, president and CEO of Envision Utah. And uh, thank you for tuning in to uh, join us in this discussion about this very important issue. Uh, education is one of the most important issues to Utahns we've found over the years as we've engaged uh, engaged people about the what they care about. Um, and Utahns want Utah to be one of the nation's leaders in education, even, even one of the world's leaders in education. They believe every child deserves the opportunity to get a great education. And for that reason, we at Envision Utah several years ago brought together a number of stakeholders uh, to, to look at uh, how we can uh, deliver what Utahns want and expect for education. And pretty early in the process, it became clear that one of the keys to great education uh, in Utah is supporting great teachers. We know that within a school, nothing affects student outcomes more than the quality of the teacher. Uh, but in Utah, we have a teacher shortage. So within the first five years, almost half of our teachers leave the profession. And we're not attracting enough new teachers joining the profession in our, at our teaching programs at our colleges and universities. So as a result, about every year, we need to hire about 3,000 new teachers uh, for growth and for, because of turnover. But we only graduate about 1,500 new teachers from our teaching programs. Um, and as a result, there's little competition for people to become teachers or to get a teaching license. And that means that te teacher training programs and schools don't have the ability to be as selective as they might want. Um, and the, the turnover also has impacts on our teachers and students and so forth. Um, so we, we began working with our stakeholders to look at a number of options to address the teacher shortage. Uh, but it became, quickly became pretty clear that nothing would have the same impact as improving teacher compensation. We surveyed college students and asked them why they didn't become teachers. We surveyed former teachers and asked them what it would take to get them back in the classroom. And the answer was the same. It's about compensation. Um, and as we surveyed the public, we saw strong support for improved teacher pay. Um, as we looked around, the, the UEA, the Utah State Board of Education, and the Governor's Education Excellence Commission had all called for improved teacher compensation, but no one had really defined what that looks like, specifically what kind of compensation. So we called together a, a task force made up of policymakers and education and business leaders and asked them to help us come up with a vision. Um, and the focus from the beginning wasn't on teachers per se, it's on the students. So the question we posed was, how do we need to compensate teachers to attract our best and brightest into the profession and keep our best teachers in the classroom so our students can get the education they need and deserve? Um, that was a, about a year ago that we released that vision for uh, teacher excellence. And since that vision was released, the world has changed. Uh, the pandemic has affected how our children receive their education. There's been an increased focus on racial and ethnic disparities. Uh, so today, we want to spend a little bit of time sharing with you that vision for teacher excellence and then talk about how recent ev events affect that vision. So today, we're going to hear from uh, a couple of members of Envision Utah's staff, as well as two members of that teacher compensation task force that generated the vision. Uh, so we'll hear from Derek Miller, who's the president and CEO of the Salt Lake Chamber, and Dr. Sidney Dixon, who is the state superintendent of public instruction. And as, as we go through this uh, webinar, uh, please submit your questions through the Q&A or through the chat. And we'll try to get to, to as many of them as we can at the end here. So now I will turn the time over to Jason Brown, who's Envision Utah's Vice President of Communications, and he's been the project lead for our education efforts. Jason? All right, thanks, Ari. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining us and being here today. Uh, to start things off, uh, I actually want to share a couple slides, so I'm going to pull those up real quick. Okay, so uh, first thing that I want to talk about, let's see. Okay, so like I already mentioned, this is the, the question that we started with. Uh, how do we need to compensate teachers in order to attract great students into the teaching profession and keep our best teachers in the classroom? And then uh, we probably add, although it makes a really long sentence, so that every student can get a great education because this is uh, the point of, of what we did. This is what we uh, were trying to accomplish uh, and what we want to accomplish in Utah is make sure every student has an opportunity to get a great education. I also wanna show you a list of the folks that we uh, worked with. So this is, uh, we pulled together a team of education leaders and experts, uh, teachers, business leaders. Also, and I think really importantly, 
uh, these are parents and grandparents who have a real close stake in education. Uh, people who have had to figure out how to hire or how to recruit employees. Uh, I show you this uh, so that you know that we didn't just make this up ourselves. Uh, we worked with the best people we could to try and solve uh, the teacher shortage, try and improve education across the board. And, uh, and I also wanted to show this to you because it speaks to a collaborative spirit that I think uh, here in Utah, we're really blessed, really lucky to have that all these people would agree to sit down together around a big table and try and solve this challenge uh, together. So uh, one last slide I wanna show you before we dive into the meat of, of what this uh, vision is, is uh, this list of the variables that we looked at. As we began our learning and discovery and discussion process, uh, we said, what could we change to better recruit and uh, better retain teachers so that we could get the outcomes that we want? Uh, these are the ifs, ands, or buts. If we change X, we could get Y. So we explored these, we discussed these, we even modeled most of them, uh, and uh, then we put them into a set of scenarios that outlined what the future could be and what the outcomes could look like. Uh, we looked at what would happen if we changed everything but compensation. We looked at what would happen if we only changed compensation or what would happen if we modeled ourselves after Finland or what would happen if we treat education more like a business uh, and, and a number of other scenarios that we looked at. And then we took those scenarios, chose the best elements and combined them to create our final set of strategies and uh, recommendations. Now, uh, not to jump around too much, but uh, to talk through those strategies, I'm gonna hand it off to Nain Christofferson. Uh, Nain has been with Envision Utah for about three and a half years. Uh, she, and in a few months, she's actually going to be leaving Envision Utah to go and do her full-time student teaching and then become a teacher herself. So she's been heavily invested in this work and been instrumental in our work on the teacher uh, shortage and on uh, looking at teacher compensation. So I'll uh, let you, Nate, talk through some of the strategies or the strategies that we found. Thanks, Jason. So before uh, I dive into each one of these strategies, I just want to point out that we've split them up into two groups here. Um, these are stabilization and optimization. And um, that's because there are a ton of strategies uh, schools could use to maximize teacher effectiveness and student learning. When we first started figuring out how could we address the teacher shortage, I think we had a list of like 22 strategies um, to like make teachers better and to draw people in. But the, the very first thing we have to do um, to impact student learning and, and teaching is to just stop the bleeding in the teacher profession. We have to stabilize the situation um, and address the teacher shortage. So that's why we've split these up. Um, but we have four strategies in this stabilization group. So our very first recommendation is to increase salaries for every single teacher in Utah. So they start at, a, at an average of about $60,000 a year and grow to roughly 110,000 over the course of a teacher's career. And to put that in perspective, uh, right now starting salaries for teachers in Utah are in the ballpark of 40 to $50,000 a year. And they grow really slowly and top out around 60,000, maybe 70,000 if, uh, you know, depending on the district you're in or if you have a master's degree or a PhD. Um, but that's after a 30 year career. So we're talking about a really, dramatic increase here in just our first strategy. It's the biggest and most important aspect of our vision. Uh, this is the primary strategy, like Ari mentioned in his introduction, it's the primary strategy our research shows will attract new teachers in droves, uh, help retain the great educators that we already have, bring former teachers back into the profession, and elevate the status of teachers across Utah, which is also super important. Um, so that's our very first strategy, and it's a big one. Um, but there are a bunch more that will sort of support um, what that first strategy will accomplish. So the next thing on our list is to strengthen teacher induction programs. So new teachers have the support they need to be successful from their very first day in the classroom. And like Jason mentioned, um, I'm student teaching in Salt Lake City School District right now. I'm in the sort of practicum phase. And it's already very, very clear to me how different the real job is going to be where I won't have somebody I can bounce ideas off of. I won't have somebody just to provide the emotional support that comes with working with teenagers or kids every day. Um, all of those things. I'm going to need really strong mentoring and access to resources from day one 
in order to do a great job for my students. So strengthening, strengthening that induction is really, really important. Uh, our third strategy under the stabilization category is to provide the option for teachers to work more days during the summer for things like professional development, leadership training, uh, curriculum planning, uh, so they can earn more money in addition to that substantial increase that comes with the first strategy. This is really a win-win. Uh, it creates an opportunity for teachers to become more effective and to work in, uh, in leadership roles while providing an avenue for better pay. Instead of working at, at you know, Costco or something during the summer, teachers can spend that time if they want to just really honing their craft. So that's our third strategy. And the last strategy in our stabilization category is pretty self-explanatory. It's just to provide more scholarships for students who are getting their teaching licenses as part of a bachelor's or master's program uh, at a Utah university. So that brings us to our next set of strategies. Um, and these are, these are our optimization strategies, meaning they're designed to come or to be implemented after these stabilization strategies are already in place. Uh, these recommendations are really more about fine tuning what should already be a robust system at that point, rather than addressing the teacher shortage. So in that category, we have four more strategies. The first one is to build stronger career pathways so that teaching can become a more dynamic career. Teachers don't have to go into administration and leave the classroom, leave the students who need them so badly uh, to work in leadership roles or increase their pay in a substantial way. They should be able to do that and stay in the classroom and stay working with kids. The next recommendation under our optimization uh, group is to encourage greater family support and engagement in education. It's really, really important that we create a statewide culture of collaboration and uh, respect between teachers and families. Having that foundation of teamwork and trust makes such a big difference. It makes everybody's lives easier, uh, those people who are invested in a child's education. So that's really important. Our third strategy in this um, umbrella uh, is to ensure that class sizes are effective for grade level and subject area. Everybody knows that Utah has really big class sizes compared to the rest of the nation. Um, but again, we can't really shrink those until we stop Utah's high teacher turnover and attrition rates. Um, that's just, we can't shrink class sizes unless we have enough teachers, it's just not possible. So once we address the teacher shortage, once these stabilization pieces are in place and we have all the people, all the qualified people we want coming into the profession, we can start to create more positions and address class sizes, which we know a lot of Utahns care about. And our last strategy uh, in the vision as a whole is just to provide adequate support professionals for teachers. So that means counselors, it means social workers, um, paraprofessionals, instructional coaches, um, and that, that's so teachers can focus on delivering an effective instruction for their students rather than doing the jobs and the paperwork of of five people. So those are the eight recommendations we make in our vision for teacher excellence. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Jason to go a little bit further in depth on this first and most important strategy, increasing pay for every teacher in Utah. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Nate. And just to everyone watching, uh, we're, we're seeing some Great questions come in on the Q&A and in the chat. Uh, some very good thought-provoking ones. We, we will, uh, for the most part, start addressing those when we get to the Q&A uh, a little bit later. Um, we might have some people on our staff who, are, who can uh, answer a couple of those as we go, though, uh, in the Q&A panel. So, um, like Nate mentioned, I'm going to uh, dive into uh, some more specific elements of our vision, particularly looking at costs. I know that it's hard to talk about uh, things we want to do to improve or change education, particularly related to compensation, without considering costs. So I'm uh, once again going to share my screen uh, to dive into uh, some of these details. If, and I should say, if what we've talked about so far is sort of our teacher vision 101, uh, this is our 400 level section. This is, uh, gets into the nitty gritty here and into some details. Uh, so stay with me. Um, first, uh, let's see, when we talk about increasing teacher salaries, um, this is what we're talking about. The green line on the bottom is the current salary curve. It's uh, where teachers start their career, ballpark of 40,000, uh, grow to around a max of 70,000 uh, over their careers. The yellow line is what we identified as the place where salaries probably need to be 
to really change the game. And, and I ought to emphasize here, we're not just talking about reducing turnover by some small percentage. We're talking about a, creating a whole new paradigm of what it means to be a teacher. Now the cost to do this just on the surface is pretty expensive. It's around $900 million uh, per year. And, uh, and then when we really look at that, we have to add in the uh, retirement benefits. Retirement benefits are a factor of salary. We, uh, teachers traditionally have really excellent retirement benefits. Um, it's, it's usually a pension, although we've made some modifications in the last decade that uh, give some flexibility there for teachers, but, uh, but it is a, 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 it's a, it's a percentage of their salary. So across the board, if we uh, add on the costs for salary to, for this increase, we're really looking at closer to a, a billion dollars uh, to do that, which is obviously really expensive. But as we went through this process, we started looking at, uh, at re the retirement piece. And we realized that it's not necessarily really effective. So we, we tried to think creatively and just explore options of what would happen if. And here's the, uh, here's the if that we came up with here. Uh, first, I think there, there, are, there are three main reasons why we look at, at retirement benefits, the current retirement benefit structure as not being very effective. First, it's not particularly effective at recruiting new teachers. Uh, we did a survey of college students. Nobody in college right now is choosing their career based on what they're expecting their retirement benefits to be. Uh, so although we provide a good benefit to teachers, that's not bringing people into the profession. And two, it's not particularly effective in retaining teachers, at least in uh, really crucial years. So Ari mentioned that we uh, lose around 40% of our new teachers in the first five years. Well, we lose more than half of our teachers uh, in the first eight years. And uh, a lot of people think that retirement doesn't really start to become important until you've been teaching for six, seven, or eight years or so. So we've already lost a good number of teachers before these benefits really start to become important uh, to, to the teachers. And then the third big issue with it is that we have a little bit of a fairness problem with our current salary or retirement benefits. So we made some changes in 2011 that mean that, uh, first of all, teachers who began before July 2011 have a much better benefit uh, than newer teachers do. We did uh, a market rate value of essentially anywhere between $6,000 and $15,000 uh, in a benefit that newer teachers don't have. Um, so basically a compensation cut. And uh, the, the, another reason that we have this sort of unfairness is that a portion of the employer's costs for newer teachers goes to cover the costs of the benefit that pre-2011 teachers get. So in other words, uh, we made some grand promises to all teachers before 2011, but it turns out that thanks to a financial crisis, uh, it's quite expensive to meet those promises. So when Nain, for instance, starts teaching, her district will have to pay the equivalent of 10% of her salary to cover the cost of the promises made to the pre-2011 teachers. Uh, plus then there's her benefit. So it all becomes quite expensive. And then the, there's another uh, issue of unfairness that came out of 2011. And that is that uh, if the promises that we made to Nain ever, or that we're making to new teachers like Nain become too expensive, she'll then have to cover a portion of those costs out of her own pocket much like uh, any other employee does in, in most industries, has to pay a little bit for their own retirement. Uh, suddenly teaching will lose that, that competitive advantage they've had. So in summary, uh, the current retirement system doesn't recruit, it doesn't retain, and there's uh, an unfairness between uh, pre-2011 and post-2011 teachers, which we're approaching a point where we're split 50-50 pre and post-2011. I know that was a lot, <laughs> stay with me. Uh, this is all, we'll see where this is going in just a second. Um, so like I said, we had to think creatively to explore some potential different options. One thing that we did is we said, instead of looking at this yellow line as a salary curve, let's call it compensation. Let's say in this case, we're talking compensation, just salary and your retirement benefits. So not healthcare, those vary uh, widely by district. We said, let's just salary and, and health benefits, call it compensation. And then for new teachers, we're going to start them, we're going to put, put them off of the old retirement system and start them about here. Their compensation is going to be that higher number at about 60000 by the time they begin a really attractive and competitive wage for a new teacher with a bachelor's or a master's degree uh, coming out of college. And their salary and their uh, retirement is going to be around that 
uh, that mark with maybe a three or five percent 401k um, there. So, and then we said for existing teachers, we're going to recognize the cost of their benefits. Now, pre-2011 teacher compensation curve is, is the right half of that red line there. Uh, they have, they're called tier one benefits. Um, they have their own costs plus what's being paid in order to make up for the uh, loss during the financial crisis. And then post-2011 teachers are uh, the left half of that. They're, the costs of their benefits are capped at 10%. But we're going to say we recognize that they have these costs. And then we're going to increase everybody to our yellow line. So in this scenario, everyone gets a raise. Everyone who's been promised great benefits still gets those great benefits. And we're able to make teaching much more attractive, much more financially rewarding, and much more competitive with other industries. And the real kicker here is that we're able to do it for much, much less. Uh, instead of costing a billion dollars, it's going to cost us somewhere between 500 and 600 uh, million dollars. And then all the other strategies that Nain talked about, those are another about 100 million dollars. So for 700 million dollars a year, we could change the world. Now, <laughs> I recognize that probably sounds like uh, a little bit, a bit of hyperbole, um, but, but it's not. It's, I mean, we, we, we mean that pretty seriously. Um, let's see, uh, I've got to pull up my notes here. Um, oh, so I want to ask, yeah, think about what it would mean for the teacher workforce if suddenly Utah had the best paid teachers in the country. Uh, think of what it would mean for recruiting new teachers. Uh, our best and smartest and most ambitious kids would be climbing over each other to get teaching degrees. Think of what it would mean for students in school who, right now that, to suddenly be in the place that had the best teachers and the best compensated teachers in the world. How does that not help them feel more confident and excited about their education? How does that not help boost student engagement? How does that not help family engagement? How does, how does that not help our business community? Uh, and I, I could go on for an hour, but I'm going to stop myself there. So uh, I should point out, though, that these calculations that we did are rough calculations. They were careful and they were thoughtful, but they're rough. The full actuarial analysis that would be required to do, look at the retirement benefits of our workforce of 30,000 teachers is pretty time consuming and pretty expensive. We're hoping to work with URS and the state to do that full analysis. Um, like I said, I, I could go on about this for a long time, but uh, this, that, that, I guess, in, uh, in a nutshell, is our vision that we came out with last year. And now we want to get, turn a little bit more to the question that we uh, asked when we came up with this webinar, which is, how does this vision stack up against 2020? Uh, so I want to turn to the, our other guests who have joined us. Uh, first, I wanna, we're going to talk to Derek Miller, the president and CEO of the Salt Lake Chamber. Uh, Derek has an amazing analytical and forward-thinking mind. It's been a real privilege to be able to work with him. And we asked him to come today uh, to pose two or to answer two questions. And those questions were, first, uh, how might a business approach uh, to a problem like a shortage or, or how, might, yeah, how might a business approach a problem like a shortage of candidates for a certain kind of position? And the second question is, how will addressing the teacher shortage and improving uh, and implementing this vision affect the business community. So Derek, I will let you answer those questions and also share uh, anything else you'd like to about the vision or about this visioning process or how it stacks up in uh, 2020. Well, thank you, Jason, for that introduction. And it's great to be with all of you. I appreciate the work that Envision Utah is doing in looking at this important issue and grateful to be part of the discussion. I also want to say how grateful I am to be part of this webinar today with my friend Sid Dixon, who I consider one of the pillars of our community and uh, a, a great thought leader, especially in the realm of education and someone I look up to, as well as all the other members of the committee earlier as we walked through this report, you had the opportunity to see what a robust and, and uh, well-represented committee this was, and I felt uh, grateful to be part of it. And as Jason mentioned, I've been invited to share some thoughts about the challenge of teacher shortage from a business perspective, as well as how that challenge affects the business community. 
Before I answer those questions, I want to just say on this particular issue that this is more than professional for me. It really is something that is close to my heart and, and something personal. Um, that's because I come from a family of teachers, a family of educators. Both of my parents are teachers. Uh, my grandparents on both sides of my family were educators. In fact, my great grandmother was a teacher in a one room schoolhouse in the Idaho frontier and used that uh, profession to provide for her family when she found herself shockingly widowed at the age of 23 with two young children. So you can either take this as my bona fides or my disclaimer of bias. Um, let's start by taking you back to your Econ 101 class, uh, something I'm sure you're all very excited to do. From a business perspective, a shortage of workers in any private sector industry can be viewed through the age old economic lens of supply and demand. If there's a high supply and low demand, prices go down. If there's a low supply and high demand, prices go up. You all understand this, not just because of your Econ 101 class, you really understand it intuitively. However, sometimes we have what we call market failure when a traditional market force does not work as expected, and that results in an inefficient distribution of goods, or in this case, of services of teachers. A public good is one example of a market failure. It's when non-payers cannot be excluded from consumption. There is some debate about whether public education fits this definition of a public good. Um, but the truth is, wherever you come down on that debate, the truth is we all want access to everyone. We want education to be uh, accessible by everyone. And certainly we would agree that if it's not a public good, that it is a merit good because it has external benefits. Market control is another example of market failure. And it could be argued that public education also fits into this category. Because although it's true there are some private education options, the majority of people are sending their children to public schools and those public schools are not governed by the same rules as a business in the private sector. By the way, I just want to pause here for just a moment and say that a market failure should not be taken in a pejorative sense. We typically think of a failure as a negative word. But in this case, when we say market failure, all we're talking about is that typical free market forces aren't necessarily working as you would expect, and in fact, aren't even necessarily applicable. I mention that to say that while I'm here to talk about the business approach to this or a private sector approach to this challenge, it's important for all of us to understand that public education is not part of the private sector and it's not therefore governed by the same internal or external rules or influences. But having said that, I believe there are some corollaries that we can make. And I believe that they are useful corollaries as it relates specifically to teacher recruitment, teacher retention, teacher pay, and prizing and valuing our teachers. So recognizing that it's not exactly the same as the private sector, let me lay out a few principles or approaches that a private sector company might take when facing a workforce shortage, which is exactly what the teacher shortage represents. And then I'll leave it to you, those who are participating, those who are watching, and I'll leave it to policymakers to determine which of these principles may apply and how they may apply them. The first is obvious. Any CEO when struggling to hire certain positions will need to either pay more for those positions increase benefits, provide work flexibility, or some combination of all three. And in fact, they probably get pretty creative in providing some combination of those three things. In fact, we saw this on full display prior to the pandemic, when a shortage of skilled workers was at the top of every business greatest challenge list. One example was in the, in the uh, tech industry with our IT coders. We just had a great shortage of those workers. And so we saw salaries increasing in those areas. Another example was welders. We had a hard time with all of the construction and building boom that's going on in our state to find people to work as uh, journeymen in some of these journeyman trades. 
The second principle or approach would be promoting your company as the best place to work. In the private sector, companies are competing against each other all the time to recruit talent. And in fact, we've seen some of that as certain in the, in the teacher shortage, as certain school districts have increased pay in order to recruit teachers away from other school districts. Now, the situation where districts are competing amongst themselves can certainly be debated whether or not that's healthy, but you certainly see it happening all the time in the private sector. The third thing I would mention is focusing upstream, developing new talent to be in that pool, recruitment pool. An example from this, as I mentioned earlier, we had a shortage of coders in our state in computer science. And so one of the things that we saw businesses doing was creating their own coding camps for high school students to go to. We also saw the tech industry, as well as the Salt Lake Chamber, make a big push with our legislature to increase funding so that we could have computer science classes in every high school throughout the state of Utah. The fourth principle I'll mention is competency-based compensation. And I would add quickly to that, that you, it is one thing to reward high performers, but it must also be coupled with remediating poor performance. And I say that because one of the most frequent conversations I've had with supervisors in the organizations where I've worked, in fact, this has been surprising to me that I've had so many of these conversations, is often I see supervisors who want to give a bonus to the very person that they've been struggling with in, on their performance reviews. And so that's just an interesting conversation to have when you say, why do you wanna give this person a bonus when just last week we were talking about performance issues they have. So it really has to work both ways, not just rewarding people, giving them compensation based on their competency, but also remediating poor performance. The fifth, uh, fifth issue I'll mention is retention. Sometimes businesses focus so much on recruiting new talent that they forget about the talent they already have. And the companies that have really uh, figured this out keep close track of turnover in their organization and the cost that that turnover is having on their bottom line. The ways that they're able to reduce that turnover, by the way, is training, formal mentoring programs, offering career upward mobility. All of them are important ways that businesses keep their employees skilled, keep them happy, and keep them within their organization. The last one that I'll highlight is actually in the report itself. It's one of the things that I feel most strongly about in the report, and that is raising the stature and status of the profession of teachers to make it a more attractive career of those who are coming up through our education system. Of all the things I've talked about, they are designed and all the things that are highlighted in the report are designed to do just that, which actually brings us full circle and brings me to the end of my comments. And the end of my comments is this, workforce is the number one input for every business. I know that you all understand that, but let me just tell you a quick story to illustrate the point. In a previous career, I had the opportunity to work at the Governor's Office of Economic Development, and part of my responsibility was recruiting new businesses to Utah. Think about some of the businesses that now call Utah home. Adobe, Goldman Sachs, Procter & Gamble, Microsoft, uh, and many others. It was my great privilege to work with these businesses as they were considering moving to Utah. Whenever I had a conversation with any of these business leaders, I always asked them, what's important to you? And here's the answer they gave me. First, workforce. Second, the cost of doing business. Third, market access. And fourth, quality of life. Without exception, every conversation I had with every business owner and business leader were those four things. And workforce was always first. They would tell me, Derek, if we can't get the right people in our organization, then nothing else matters. 
you can have the lowest cost of doing business, the best market access, a most wonderful quality of life. But if we can't find the right people, nothing will make up for that. And if we want the right people, if we want to continue in our state to have the best workforce, then we need the best teachers. Thanks again for having me today. Thank you very much, Derek. I, we appreciate you being on and, and sharing some of that. Um, now we wanna uh, hear from uh, Superintendent Sydney Dixon. I agree with Derek, she is a, a pillar in our community. Superintendent Dixon is truly, in my opinion, a really a thoughtful and innovative leader. Uh, she's been a gracious and a very willing collaborator. And we also asked her to come and answer a couple questions today. Uh, we uh, gave her these questions. Uh, first, how has the pandemic affected your thinking uh, about the vision? And then uh, secondly, how could elements of the vision impact the racial disparities that we see in education and that have also been uh, at the forefront of more of our minds? So, uh, Superintendent, I will let you answer those and uh, anything else that you'd also like to add. Thank you so much. Um, I am in a remote setting today, so my internet seems to be going up and down a little bit and that you will see what it's been like for many families in this situation. So first I want to thank Envision Utah for their amazing support of educators in our state and for public education overall. Uh, I think the most important speaker today has been named as one of our pre-service teachers and hearing her experience Teaching is hard because it matters a lot. So I want to highlight what we've found during this pandemic and how we've encountered challenges, but uh, what we're thinking about as we come through these challenges. I also want to thank Derek so much. He is one of my favorite people on the planet and one of the finest men I know. And now I know, Derek, in part, it's your DNA of educators, uh, a longevity of educators in your family but you're a fine human being as well. So thank you so much um, for those kind words. I want to share some slides, not to, not to belabor some of the points that have been discussed, but just to kind of walk you through some of the things that I've been thinking about. I'll try and share my screen here and we'll hope for success. Okay, and I am going to um, turn off my video just to hopefully not have to deal with um, internet issues. All right, so many of you on this call have children, grandchildren, neighbors, maybe some of you are teachers, and so you know a lot of this, but we learned from the um, spring through remote learning, and I won't go into all the details because most of you are aware of those details, but we quickly learned that we needed to assess home needs and then really modify policies around the technology. And this is where we had our uh, business community, mem many members of the chamber lean in very quickly to try and help us expand broadband and get devices out into homes and feed students. Um, we learned very quickly also something we've always known, but additional professional learning was really essential for our educators. Many of them due to our digital teaching and learning initiative had already engaged in professional learning, but it's very different when you are forced into a fully remote um, system, system and some, many of our educators just weren't prepared for that. We also um, had it reiterated to us how important the partnerships are with parents and that it's so integral to student success, something we've always known, but we really developed these stronger, much stronger relationships with parents and saw how important that is. Okay, slides not advancing. There we go. Um, we also have always known about the mental health and social emotional needs of our students and how important that is. Back in April, we conducted a survey of school principals and ask them to anticipate so, what some of the greatest factors were, not only in coming back, but how had these been impacted by the pandemic. And you can see the anxiety, social isolation, stress, a lot of these were really apparent during the spring. Now by getting most of our students back physically face-to-face -face in schools, we have been able to not completely eliminate some of these needs, but really 
provide support through social workers, mental health counseling, and just being together in school and showing that we have educators and support systems that really care about students and their families. So we've had to really concentrate on these needs. And we've had schools that for the first couple of weeks, for example, all they did was deal with a social emotional part of schooling. So I wanna highlight some noteworthy practices as we've now returned in the fall. First of all, schools physically are pretty safe right now. We have, um, we have the virus on the rise. So you're saying, how can this be superintendent when we've got case counts of 1500 every day? You're right, and it's concerning. It's very concerning to all of us. But our educators and support staff and everybody in the system have worked very hard to try and make schools as safe as possible. Cleaning the statewide mask mandate for our schools has really helped with that. So we don't have a lot of evidence that they're spread within the school. It tends to be more outside of the school and in the ecosystem with activities. And remember that socialization that we talked about that students were feeling isolated. Well, they love to be together. So it's, that's part of the situation outside of the classroom. Um, again, I've already talked about these social emotional connections, but they really have been critical. And I'm so proud of our schools who have really leaned in and spent a great deal of time making sure that students feel connected, that they feel safe, and that we're dealing with the trauma that they felt during the pandemic away from school, as well as things that they're facing at this point in time. We did have, um, we continue to have our education community indicate that by holding virtual back to school nights and parent conferences, they've had the highest percentage of attendance that they've ever had. And so many people are saying, you know, these are some things we might want to consider for the future and keep because we have been able to engage parents and there's been more equity of parents who work or parents who may not have transportation. There's also been a notation of fewer behavior problems among students. Now you can hypothesize that this might be they're just so happy to be back together. Masks are on, so maybe there's um, less bullying in some, some circumstances. Um, but I would purport that it's um, also structurally. For example, staggering recesses so that we have fewer students in the hallways and out on the playground, staggered um, lunches. These are things in the elementary setting and secondary systems, again, changing schedules, those kinds of things. Um, and really this increased connection that this triangulation of parents, schools and students has been um, so important. And, and that's something that schools want to keep those stronger partnerships. Our technology is much better. We already were at about 70% of our students being able to connect to devices in the spring. That's much higher now, of course. Our educators are just killing it. They're doing such a great job of being creative, but we're also killing them off in terms of just their stress and mental and physical fatigue. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And then um, the investment in professional learning, technology, really focusing on equity and cultural appreciation, all of those things that have happened in the fall in, in preparing our educators to return has really paid off in dividends. So um, I'm one who, whenever I'm out and about, if people don't stop me, sometimes I'll stop them, especially students, and ask them how it's going. But I do have some formal ways of getting feedback. So I have advisory councils of teachers, principals, charter directors, and superintendents, and then a larger advisory council that really connects people who have any kind of connection to education, um, nonprofit partners, and other agencies. And you can see the list that I won't go into, and it also includes our um, local and state health and uh, epidemiologists. So based on all the feedback that I get, here are the concerns that are being expressed in relationship to COVID and maybe just even moving forward. It's already been mentioned, our teachers are so overwhelmed. Um, they're burned out due to long hours. And for many of our teachers, they're teaching in multiple modes. They might be teaching face-to-face -face in the day, and then they're teaching online after school or on a Friday and they're cleaning all the time. And there's just a lot of stress associated with trying to mitigate the, the impact of the virus and prevent the virus itself from coming into the classroom. Our principals have become contact tracers, calling about students in quarantine, um, trying to track down students who have absences, working with families. Um, I know many of them experience what I do, and that is uh, emails and phone calls about keep our kids in school face to face, Otherwise, it would be problematic or keep our kids out of school because it's problematic. We want them remote. So there are a lot of perspectives that our principals and, and leaders are dealing with. For those systems, 
where students are online for the first time, uh, we see that there's more of a struggle. And what I mean by that is if you are a face-to-face -face system and also providing online support for some of our students, that's where we see the struggles. If you're a student who's been in an online charter school or an online setting in a district, um, or perhaps Salt Lake District, where they are fully online, um, there might be some disengagement, but at least we can find kids, we know where they are, they're connected. In the face-to-face -face systems at the secondary level, in spite of them being engaged and in the classroom, teachers are reporting higher failure rates. So we're wondering about this disconnection to um, education altogether. Are they taking it as seriously? So these are some of the things that are still um, apparent in our system. Childcare is an issue. Um, we have trauma that's still there and some of our younger kiddos are acting out based on that. And then just all the politicization and the time of the elections and everything going on, there's just a lot of stress and anger and that works its way into the classroom and students needing ex uh, extra support. So I want us to just quickly think about a couple of things. One, um, I'm struck by we've been talking about reimagining our system based on what we're learning. And I'm struck by this notion of our natural world around us that really uses these three R's of resiliency, recovery, and renewal. And that's how I feel our educators are moving through this, that in spite of all of the stress, they're thinking about ways to continue to improve and um, they are resilient. But I want to draw your attention to um, a quote by Oka Joshi Hansen. I heard her speak a couple of days ago. She's with Education Reimagined. And she said, DNA of our current system is coded for existing models and traditional ways of thinking. And that has really impacted my thinking about the pandemic. We've danced around a lot of edges and how can we really change our mental models about schools so that they work for teachers? So I don't have time to go through all of this, um, but if you have a, a, a minute to quickly read this and note that we are shifting our focus to Utah Portrait of a Graduate. It's a way to think more holistically about education for our students. And it will enable us to establish our schools as places places of feedback, places of engaged learning for all, and um, very equity driven, meaning that every student has what they need in order to do their very best work. They have the resources and, and demographics, geography, um, their economic status should not matter in terms of quality. And then really creating those conditions for both our students and our teachers to succeed and lead. So in order to recode our DNA, then we really must reinvest in teacher excellence. And everybody's talked about ways to do this today. So I won't spend a great deal of time and my time is up, but just notice the bold um, headlines here of, we have to really think about the ecosystem of support. It's, it's about the pay, but it's also about the working conditions and what kind of ecosystem do we put forward so we can get to that excellence that Derek talked about. Leadership matters a lot teacher preparation programs matter a lot, parent partnerships, and how do we expand those high school programs that Derek talked about for aspiring teachers to reflect diversity of our schools especially. And then understanding the critical investment in teachers as human capital. And you'll note that I underlined the verbs, providing opportunities for them as, as Nain kind of talked about early on, um, establishing induction, mentoring, communities of care so that new teachers like Nain have all the support they need to, to not only survive, but to thrive. And um, we've already talked about recruiting and, and retaining a diverse workforce, but I wanna end on this last note that we, as Derek indicated and others have indicated, Jason put a punctuation mark on this. We must view teaching as a high wage, high demand and high impact profession. Thank you. Thank you so much, Superintendent. I appreciate you taking the time to be here and, and to share some of that with you. And uh, I guess my own commentary on that to, uh, to everyone else here, when I hear things like that and, and listen to our, our education leadership talk about what the future could be, that, that sort of reminds me what the purpose of us bringing people together to do this visioning exercise was originally, is, is how can we make sure that we have the workforce here, that we have enough teachers who have the support they need to be able to make that bright future uh, a reality. So um, 
before we get to the, the Q&A portion, we're, we're almost through here, but before we get to the q and A, I have just a few more points that, that we wanted to make. The question that kicked off this discussion and webinar today is uh, how does the, this vision that, that we presented in the first 20 minutes stack up against 2020? And in short, our answer at Envision Utah is that the vision is still important. In fact, probably more important uh, and more urgent now than it was in 2019. If we have uh, better compensation, we will be able to make teaching a more attractive and competitive profession. We can ensure the best and brightest are not only entering the profession, but staying in the classroom. And if we can strengthen the teacher induction programs, we'll be able to ensure that teachers get the training and support they need to be prepared to, be prepared to, to meet students in the many circumstances that they're asked to, to work in now. Uh, if we have options for teachers to work more days, for instance, uh, for more pay or to, uh, or to allow adequate opportunities to prepare for contingencies like teaching in a pandemic, uh, if we can create that flexibility and adaptability for teachers, they'll be so much more effective at teaching our, our children, our students. And uh, another point that I really want to underline here is that one of the most important ways to address the opportunity gap that we see between white students, even in Utah and students of color, is to ensure that we have a diverse teacher workforce. Uh, the research is, is very clear that if students can have in their career, even one teacher that uh, looks like them and or has the same racial or ethnic background as them or, or shares these characteristics with them, that it can do wonders for improving that student's likelihood, not only to graduate from uh, K through 12, graduate from high school, but to go on and succeed in college. So uh, it's imperative to increase teacher compensation, improve teacher compensation, not only to address the teacher shortage, but also to attract more people of color and first generation students into the classroom so that our teachers can match the changing demographics of the state of Utah. And of course, uh, providing more scholarships, which was another one of our strategies, is uh, an important thing that can help us accomplish this goal. And then I also want to point out that all of the optimization strategies uh, that name talked to will also make sure our teachers are well trained, that they're innovative and flexible, uh, more robust career pathways will create opportunities for teachers to uh, better support or mentor or train other teachers. Uh, more effective class sizes will allow teachers more time to meet the individual needs of their students, not to mention help with uh, physical distancing when that's needed. And uh, adequate support professionals within each school will help teachers adapt to changing circumstances by assisting with the trauma that was mentioned or the other challenges uh, that, that seem to be increasing. So um, again, <laughs> no, probably no surprise to many of you, but the answer to our initial question is, we believe that this vision is a, a vision that's needed more than ever that 2020 has simply increased the urgency with which we need to pursue changing how we view our teachers, elevating the profession as a whole. Uh, we need to be able to attract the best and the brightest among us into the teaching profession. We need to make sure that, that teachers have the support so that they, the best teachers right now will stay in the classroom and, that all teacher, and so that all teachers can be more effective. Uh, and with all of that, uh, we're going to now turn to a Q&A. So I'm going to uh, let Ari uh, jump in and sort of uh, kick that portion off. And then uh, Ari, is there are, are questions uh, that you want me or Nain or, of course, Superintendent Dixon or, or Derek Miller to, to answer? We are uh, happy to do that. Um, we, uh, it, a part of our clever planning was to have this end at 4.30 so that if it doesn't end at 4.30, <laughs> there's still a little bit of time before the end of the day. So um, if, if uh, Sid or Derek, if you have to jump off at any point, we definitely understand. Anyone else who has to jump off, but we're, we're happy to stay and uh, continue the Q&A as long as there are people asking uh, questions that we feel like we can address. So uh, Ari, I'll let you uh, lead us through that. Right, thanks, Jason. Uh, I think we're gonna start with the $600 million question, which is uh, where will the money come from? Uh, we, we got that question specifically and then uh, uh, even more specifically, we got asked uh, about uh, higher tax rates for people with uh, with more children or the R schools now effort a few years ago that sought to generate $750 million in, in new education revenue. So I think I'm gonna let any of you who uh, 
who want to speak to that? Where, where do we come up with $600 million? Jason, you want to take that first or? <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't know that I. Uh, I have the great answer. A great answer to that. The first, I will point out though that in this visioning uh, process, we we intentionally didn't answer that question. Uh, in in visioning, we wanted to make sure that we were first answering the question of what do we need to do, uh, and then uh, so that we can then figure out the actual uh, logistics and specifics of of doing that. Uh, it's and I guess the the other way I'd answer that is we're probably not talking about a silver bullet solution to come up uh, with the those resources there's probably not one magic pot where we can say oh look here it is this money was hiding the whole time or or one uh, you know tax increase or something like that that could take care of all of that it's probably a, a bunch of brass bullets that uh, a, a combination of different strategies coming together to try and uh, and address that issue. Anybody else want to weigh in on that question of $600 million? Where does that come from? I'll just jump in and add that we know um, from our own polling at Envision Utah that Utahns want to fund increased teacher salaries. Um, they're, they care about that. They're willing to pay. So while you know one tax increase probably isn't going to make up that entire amount, we know that Utahns care enough about um, supporting teachers that they're willing to, you know, pay more taxes for that. Doesn't, all right, doesn't sound like anybody else wants to weigh in on that one. Um, I think uh, Jason touched on this a little bit, but I, th I think it's worth spending a little bit more time on. Um, how do we plan to recruit and train a diverse pool of teacher candidates who are representative of Utah's school population? I can take that one. Sure. I can get technology to work. There we go. Um, well, I think it goes back to the business model that Derek was actually talking about and really thinking about from a young age, how do we get uh, our students interested? First of all, they have to see that their teachers love their job and they're happy. That tends to beget um, enthusiasm from young people wanting to be teachers. And every time you talk to a teacher, they can mention somebody who influenced them to become a teacher. In my own case, it was my grandmother who was my teacher when I was a child and I thought she was magical. So that kind of influence over our students and then creating ways and spaces for our most um, economically challenged students who don't find themselves thinking about college, providing ways for them to become teachers. We already have a scholarship program, the, the, Benyon, Scho uh, the uh, Benyon Scholarship, the TH Bell Scholarship, there are uh, a variety of opportunities, but it's not quite enough to get them in the door and keep them going. So there are ways to target that. And then uh, first and foremost, expanding what we have already in high schools. And that are these um, CTE offerings of teacher credit. So kids can take two or three courses and get college credit and concurrent enrollment while learning to become a teacher. So we have ways to do that now. All of these ways need to be expanded. But specific tapping our students of color, our students who live in poverty, and lifting them up and helping them find ways to become teachers, letting them know they'd be a great teacher and why, putting the idea of planting a seed is really important. Anyone else want to speak up on that one? Maybe not on that one, Ari, but can I really quick just go back to the previous question and speak to what Nain uh, mentioned? I think it's probably worth uh, sharing something uh, with with the group here. We did some, uh, we've done polling around education issues and priorities uh, for several years in a row now. And uh, I just wanted to show this, uh, I think this is really fascinating. In, in 2016, we asked uh, Utahns if they believed that it was important to provide better support for teachers. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, we saw three quarters of Utahns in 2016 uh, say that they did. That they, they rated on a one to five scale, and this is the fours and the fives. Uh, felt like it was important to provide better support for teachers. By 2019, and then again in 2020, uh, that number has risen to uh, 90 and 91 percent. And I should mention that 2020 number is from last month. Uh, people are Utahns right now, it, after the pandemic, even feeling like 
it's uh, important that we provide better support for teachers. And then uh, this bottom one is also really interesting. We asked, the question is, uh, would you be willing to pay for increased education funding? Four years ago, we had a pretty, a very uh, lukewarm majority. We had 51% of Utahns saying that they felt that way. Uh, in 2019, at the beginning of 2019, uh, we saw 71%. And once again, even now, at, in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a recession, we have uh, three quarters of Utahns saying, uh, responding to our poll saying, yes, they are willing uh, to pay for increased funding for education. So in answer to the, the $600 million question of where the money will come from, uh, again, it's probably not the only way, but we do know that Utahns are passionate about teachers and are willing uh, to put their money where their priorities are, uh, at least to, uh, to some extent, uh, according to our polling. So uh, sorry to backtrack onto that. Um, I'll let you go on to the next question. All right. Great. Um, let's see, we, we got a, a question about uh, the multiple pathways toward teacher licensure. And this may be a good question for uh, Superintendent Dixon. Um, how, how do we factor in those different pathways into this vision to make sure that everybody is uh, getting the rigorous and effective training they need, uh, either pre-service or in-service? That's a great question. So the uh, person who has the question is likely aware that we have changed our licensing structure. I used to joke that there were like 124 ways to get a license and we've tried to really streamline that and streamline the bureaucracy. But at the end of the day, we're holding all teachers to the same standards and uh, really finding ways to show what they know. So getting away from, um, from, from multiple choice questions on a test, for example, to performance assessments and really having teachers be part of that process and part of a uh, culture of feedback. And that happens at the pre-service in a level in a real traditional format or somebody who is a career changer as well. So really that's the key is changing the culture to be one of feedback and making sure that everybody's clear about the standards that we hold our teachers to, not just from an ethical perspective. Uh, some people think of that when we talk about standards, but then we have to turn around and give them the kind of support they need. I think Nain spoke to this very well, that if we're to retain her, that she will need mentoring and effective induction and professional learning all along the way. As I talked about early on in the pandemic and a lot of our teachers needing to teach in the remote setting, we asked them to be nimble. And I know Heidi Matthews is on the call and she can tell you um, that, you know, it's sort of like you're feel, you feel like Gumby uh, but I'll, if any of you are old enough to know who Gumby is and you really try to bend Gumby, he's not really that flexible. You know, you can only bend so much. And so we have to give our teachers and leaders the kind of support that they really need, regardless of how they get to us in the profession. I think our board has done a good job of uh, getting away from a lot of bureaucracy of licensing and thinking about how we get people um, licensed in the profession, but in order to keep them, we have to do the very things that Nain said she will need to be successful. Great. Um, we also got a question about uh, uh, healthcare costs. Um, and, you know, the vision deals with uh, salary and retirement and really does not deal with, with healthcare costs. Um, why was that decision made? I can go ahead and answer that uh, sure. simply because um, the retirement benefits are uh, standardized across the state. So every teacher has the same uh, retirement structure, at least. The, the, and uh, healthcare is very variable depending on districts. There are some districts who have uh, you know, expensive and very robust programs, and some districts who maybe uh, can't afford those expensive and very robust programs uh, have you know, lesser programs. So, um, because it's in Utah, at least not a a standard uh, a standardized benefit, uh, we we didn't deal with it. Uh, plus, there is also a strong desire among the districts uh, to maintain some control over their own system. They don't want to hand over and say we need a, a a single state system where every teacher is on the exact same sc salary schedule, every teacher gets the exact same benefits package. Uh, they want to act like uh, like any other organization in any other industry and be able to uh, draw on their strengths and, uh, and uh, attract people the way they can and want to attract people. And one other thing I guess this brings up that I ought to mention is that 
our, our vision is not uh, proposing a statewide salary schedule or anything. It's, it was saying this is, as a whole, where the profession needs to head if we want to make sure that it is attractive and competitive and supportive in the ways that we want it to be attractive and competitive and supportive. Uh, and, and the costs that we outlined were the costs, uh, uh, the, the resources that would need to be available so that every district could move in that direction and approximate it. And some may decide that, you know, uh, we're in a community that attracts people for different reasons. We maybe won't be quite at that exact salary level. And others might say that we need to be beyond that salary level to compete with where we are. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, I just thought that was probably important to mention that it, it allows for some flexibility there. Kind of along that line, I just want to jump in and say how important it is that every district does have the capability to increase their salaries to this level. Um, in recent years, we've seen some districts um, be able to raise, you know, the money to increase salaries in their districts pretty substantially, which is fantastic. But the problem with that is that it draws great teachers from neighboring districts that can't afford the same increases away from the schools that really need them. So we see people leaving their rural schools um, and going to, you know, coming to the Salt Lake Valley where, you know, districts can pay, pay more. Um, and that's great for that one district and it's great for the kids in that district, but it hurts kids nearby. It, and it doesn't, um, it doesn't do anything to uplift the quality of education in Utah as a whole, which is really the goal of this vision is for every district to kind of be on the same page. So every kid in Utah has access to that um, great instruction. All right, well, this is a, a question that uh, we've actually gotten a number of times. Um, how do we keep poor performers from earning $110,000? I you know, talk about this vision and I'll hear people say, well, what about my teacher in fourth grade who was terrible? Are we really gonna raise their salary? And, and, and why is it that we can't get rid of those teachers? What do you say to that? Well, I'll jump back, back in on that one. I think um, the biggest answer to this question is that if, if we're paying teachers between 60 and $110,000 a year, um, we don't need to keep bad teachers in the classroom anymore. So um, this will be a competitive enough career that schools will be able to be really, really selective about who they hire um, and who they keep. And so I don't think that's really a question we need to ask. Um, and also part of this, part of this vision includes, you know, supporting teachers who are struggling. It's a really hard job. And um, you know, teachers might struggle from year to year, kids change from year to year, their needs change. And so hopefully this, you know, with, with you know, the, the complete implementation of this vision, teachers who are not doing a great job will get the support they need to improve. So we don't have to let them go. We don't have to uh, turn people over that way. Can I jump in on this, Ari, for a minute? Yeah, please. And this, this is really associated with the way we fund or don't fund our schools in Utah. Um, there's a lot of cheerleading about the importance of educators, but not always a lot of uh, coaching. And that's because when we're short on funds, the first thing to go are personnel who are highly trained to be instructional coaches to support our teachers. So I think Derek, I, I loved his description of uh, not only it wasn't around just pay, but how we retain quality talent that uh, we remediate where need be and we retain and, and buoy up those um, excellent teachers. So I think this is an area that we have to understand when we are last in pupil spending, these are the things that we don't have in our schools. We don't have extra personnel who are trained to be instructional coaches to support our new teachers and those who might be struggling. And when we have had those, again, one of the first things to go in budget cuts so this is that ecosystem of support I talked about. It's not just about the teacher in the classroom. It's making sure we have people who can help and support them. And if they're not going to make it, then it's much easier to help them find another profession. I think our teacher association, uh, plural teacher associations, but I do believe they get a bad rap. My experience as a principal, a district administrator that they've worked hand in glove, they don't want poor teachers in the classroom or ineffective, I should say, in the classroom. So, um, I do believe that that as an ecosystem, we have to think about the kind of support. It's not just cheerleading, cheerleading and saying, yay, we love our teachers. Do we show we love them by providing them great leaders, instructional coaches, the kind of support they need to do their best work? 
Great. I think we'll, we'll do one more question here. Um, uh, and this has to do with this moment in time um, that uh, I think Superintendent Dixon spoke to this a little bit that uh, the profession right now is being very stretched and stressed, um, having to deal with, in some cases, teaching online and in class at the same time, you know, essentially two different classes. Um, what, what can we do now to help teachers at this moment in time? Everybody's smiling. I can, this is about a 20 minute conversation, but in some, I think it goes back to, again, I don't want to overuse the word ecosystem, but really that system of support for our teachers. So instead of being quick to judge if something doesn't go well online for a moment, or, um, you know, a teacher didn't connect with a parent or a parent didn't do their job, everybody's challenged right now. Everybody's challenged. I don't know anybody that's like, well, I, I did meet one person that said, I am meant for this moment because I like working alone and I like working at home and I don't like talking to people and I don't like going out. So other than that, I think most people really are struggling during this COVID moment. And so we, first of all, we just need to give each other a break and um, we certainly can expect quality, but just know that things aren't always going to go smoothly. Um, second, what are we asking our teachers to do? I know our board is looking at things that we can waive, um, waive waiving some forms of teacher evaluation, like the summative where there are a lot of observations and a lot of paperwork. Um, that's something that we've done for this year and thinking about assessment and just like, what are all of the things that are on teachers' plates? So uh, if, if our districts and our charters are expecting a lot of uh, um, things of our teachers that they would normally be doing, this isn't a normal year. So what is essential? What do we need to do to ensure our students feel cared for and that they're taught well? And we just have to let go of a lot of other stuff that we're used to, you know, that's in our DNA. We have to recode for the COVID moment. Great. Anybody want, oh, Jason wants the last word, I think. Well, I don't know if it needs to be the last word, but I'll say one, one more thing about that is, I think um, something that's part of that question when, when we get it is, is sort of this idea that, well, this is a really grand and robust vision. It's not uh, something that we can uh, implement right away. And to which I would say, uh, that's probably true. It's probably not going to uh, take, uh, you know, one legislative session, for instance, to just to uh, work out a system where we suddenly have the resources to implement everything. And even if we did have the resources, it would take some time to, to scale up the, the uh, ecosystem of supports that teachers need and to um, and to implement those, but we can we can start taking steps towards uh, this vision. It's it's a vision that that could be implemented over uh, the next you know few years if we re if we as a state really decided this is where we need to go. We can uh, we could start taking steps towards it. And and I also want to uh, mention with that one of the big elements that we talked about with this vision is um, not just the specific changes that these strategies would make, but on the, this, this idea of elevating the profession as a whole and elevating education as a whole, the impact that it, that it would have, uh, that this vision would have on that. And, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily take um, an entire infusion of the whole $600 million next year to, uh, to change the way people feel about education in Utah, to change the way teachers feel about, uh, you know, how their community supports them, to change the way students feel about where they are. But if we, if we decide that this is the direction that we as a state uh, need to head, <clears throat> then I, we can start to make some of that change now. We can get that sort of change in the ether and that feeling and excitement and uh, enthusiasm in the air uh, you know, even now, as we uh, before we're able to necessarily uh, make everything uh, implemented right away. That's actually probably a pretty good last word there, Jason. <laughs> Anything else we need to say before we sign off? Okay, well, all right. Well, if, I, if I can speak and say thank you, everyone, for uh, coming and participating today. We will uh, put this webinar up uh, so it's available for you to go back and, and look at as well. And we're always happy to uh, answer questions or, or uh, meet or talk to everyone if uh, anyone would like to reach out to Envision Utah. Uh, I'm Jason. You can reach me at jbrown at envisionutah.org. Uh, and uh, 
thank you uh, to Superintendent Dixon and thanks to Derek Miller, I had to jump off for uh, being here and participating in this. Thanks everybody. <laughs>